Well, Watson, what do you make of it? You almost believed I had eyes in the back of my head. But all I really needed was a well-polished coffee pot in front of me to see what he was up to. I joined him in attempting to reconstruct the character of a man based on the examination of his walking stick. From the testimonial inscription, he was able to furnish me with details from one of his professional colleagues in the medical directory. Mortimer, James, MRCS, 1882, Grimpen, Dartmoor, Devon. House surgeon from 1882 to 84, Charing Cross Hospital, winner of the Jackson Prize for Comparative Pathology, corresponding member of the Swedish Pathological Society, etc., etc. Officer for the parishes of Grimpen, Thorsley, and High Bath. In my experience, it is only an amiable man in this world who receives testimonials at all. Only an unambitious one who abandons London career for one in the country. And only an absent-minded one who leaves behind his stick instead of his calling card. And the dog who carries this stick behind its master, the teeth marks are quite visible. The bite too broad for a terrier, but not broad enough for a mastiff. A curly-haired spaniel. I saw the creature itself on our daughter. And then I heard the ring of its owner, bringing us nefarious news of past, present, and future import. As to the past, this, 1742 to be exact, of the origin of the Hound of the Baskerville. I had the story from my father, who had it from his, and believe it occurred as it here set forth. Learn also from this story, my sons, not to fear the fruits of the past, but be circumspect in the future, that those foul passions whereby our family suffered so grievously may not be again loosed to our undoing. Know then, at the time of the Great Rebellion, Hugo of Baskerville Manor was held to be a most wild, profane, and godless man. There was in him a certain wanton and cruel humour which made his name a byword throughout the West. In his fashion he came to love the daughter of a local yeoman. Being of good repute, she avoided him, fearing his evil name. So, one Michaelmas Hugo and his wicked companions carried her off to the hall. The maiden was placed in an upper chamber while Hugo and his friends caroused, as was their nightly custom. The poor lass was likely to have her wits turned at the singing, shouting, and terrible oaths that came up from below. Finally, in the stress of fear, she did what might have daunted the bravest of men, climbing down from under the eaves, then homeward, across the moor. When Hugo found the cage empty, the bird flown, he became as one that hath a devil in him. He cried aloud before all company that he would render his body and soul to the powers of evil if he might but overtake the witch. Hugo took to his mare, unkennelled his hounds, and rode off full cry into the moonlight over the moor. The revellers stood agape, unable to understand all that had been done in haste, and on their bemused wits awoke, and thirteen took to horse and started in pursuit. They passed a night shepherd upon the moor and demanded to know if he had seen the hunt. Crazed with fear, he said he had seen the maiden with the hounds on her track, Hugo Baskerville on his black mare, and running mute behind him, a hound of hell at his heels. Cursing the shepherd, the drunken squires rode on, but their skins turned cold as the black mare went past trailing its bridle, an empty saddle. Riding slowly, they came upon the hounds, whimpering in a cluster, Staring eyes gazing down the narrow valley before them. More sober than when they started, three of the boldest rode forward into the deep dip of the mire. There in the clearing lay the unhappy maid where she had fallen, dead of fear and fatigue. But it was not the sight of her body, nor that of Hugo Baskerville lying near her, 
which raised the hair upon the heads of these dead of roisters. A great black beast, shaped like a hound, yet larger than ever mortal eyes rested upon, had torn the throat from Hugo Baskerville and turned its blazing eye upon the three. One, it is said, died that night of what he had seen. The other two were but broken men for the rest of their days. Such is the tale, my sons, of the coming of the hound, which is said to have plagued our family ever since. I warn you not to cross the moor in those dark hours where the power of evil is exalted. For the present, it seems a line of footprints attested to the fact that the current incumbent Charles Baskerville had made his way down an alley of yew trees to the very borders of his domain. Drops of ash showed that old Sir Charles had waited on a dark, damp night in the cold of the moor for ten minutes to a quarter of an hour. A change in the footprints to tiptoe attested to the fact that he was running running desperately for his life to where he was found, with a look of shock and horror on his face that attested to the sudden, violent failure of his heart. And the clue as to its cause, the footprints of a gigantic to the future import of these nefarious news. Old Sir Charles's nephew and heir, it seems, from the Northumberland Hotel where he dwelt while his estate was put in order, and had an old brown boot taken, and this note of alarm in its place had been given. As you value your life or your reason, keep away from the moor. These words, I believed, were taken from the previous day's Times newspaper, in particular a capital article on free trade. There is much difference in my eyes between the leaden bourgeois type of a Times article and the slovenly print of an even hidden newspaper. A Times leader is entirely distinctive, and those words could have been taken from nothing else. The words were cut out using nail scissors as the cutter had to take two snips in places. They were then pasted in place with gum. The word more was written in ink simply because it could not be found in print. The pen splattered twice in a single word and ran dry three times writing the short address. A private pen or ink bottle is seldom allowed to be in such a state, but with a hotel pen or ink it is rare to get anything else. I had little hesitation in saying that we could examine the waste paper baskets of the hotels around Charing Cross until we find the mutilated Times leader, and thereby lay our hands upon the person who sent this singular message. It was evident from what we heard that young Baskerville had been closely shadowed since he had been in town. How else could it have been so quickly known which hotel he had chosen to stay at? And his pursuer. A black-bearded man bearing an uncanny resemblance to Barrymore, the Baskerville butler, had the audacity to take his seat in a cab outside our window. We gave chase. And returned, catching nothing but the number of the cab. 2704. Every thread at which I grasped to unravel this strange investigation was broken at a touch. I have heard that Barrymore is at the hall. Baskerville. And it goes one thread. I have visited 23 hotels as directed, but sorry to report, unable to trace cut sheet of the times. Cartwright, a lad in the employ of a Mr. Wilson, the manager of one of the local district messenger offices. I recall the case in which I was able to save his good name, reputation, and quite possibly his life.
John Clinton, 3 Turpy Street, the Borough. My cab, 2704, is out of Shipley's Yard near Waterloo Station. The gentleman, my fare, told me he was a detective, and I was to say nothing about him to anyone. I'd put him at forty years of age and of middle height. He dressed like a toff, had a black beard and a pale face. He mentioned his name as Mr. Sherlock. I could only hope that since such a cunning adversary had foxed me at every turn in London, that Watson had fared better in Dartmoor in my place. First report of Dr. Watson. Baskerville Hall, October. My dear Holmes, the longer one stays here in this godforsaken corner of the world, the deeper does the spirit of the moor sink into one's soul. But I digress. Several incidents have occurred of late, not least of which is the belief that an escaped convict named Selden has got away. A fortnight has passed since his flight from His Majesty's prison Dartmoor, during which he has not been seen or heard of. It is inconceivable that he held out on the moor all that time. We think, therefore, that he has gone. I confess I have had uneasy moments when I thought of Mr. Stapleton, the local naturalist, and his sister, living miles from any assistance. They would be helpless in the hands of such a desperate fellow. Sir Henry suggested that Perkins, the groom, should stay with them, but Stapleton would not hear it. In fact, our friend the Baron had displayed a considerable interest in our neighbour's fair sister. There is something tropical exotic about her in singular contrast to her cool and unemotional brother. And yet I suspect he has hidden fires. One would imagine that Stapleton would welcome such a match, yet I have more than once caught a look of the strongest disapprobation on his face when Sir Henry has paid attention to his sister. I am certain he does not wish their intimacy to ripen and has taken pains to prevent them from being tete-a-tete. -tete. Your instructions never to allow Sir Henry to go out alone will prove onerous if a love affair were added to our difficulties. My popularity would soon suffer were I to carry out your orders to the letter. One other neighbour I have met since I wrote last is Reverend Franklin of Laftor Hall, who lives four miles to the south of us. He is an elderly, red-faced gentleman with a passion for British law, and has spent a large fortune in litigation. This aside, he seems a kindly and good-natured person. He is an amateur astronomer and owns an excellent telescope, with which he sweeps the moor in the hope of catching a glimpse of the escaped convict Selden. However, as I close, let me tell you more about the Barrymores. He the butler, and she the housekeeper, and last night's surprising developments. Mrs. Barrymore is a heavy, solid person, very limited, intensely respectable, and inclined to be puritanical hardly conceive a less emotional subject. On the first night here I heard a woman sobbing. Since then I have more than once observed traces of tears upon Mrs. Barrymore's face. Some deep sorrow gnaws ever at her heart. Sometimes I wonder if she has a guilty memory which haunts her. I suspect Barrymore of being a domestic type. There is something questionable in his character, and the adventure of last night brings all my suspicions to a head. About two in the morning, I was awakened by a stealthy step passing by my room. It was Barrymore, and there was something indescribably furtive and guilty. His appearance. Barrymore was crouching at a window, staring out at the blackness of the moor. For some minutes he stood, watching intently. Then he gave a deep groan and with an impatient gesture he put out the light. There is some secret business going on here in this house of gloom. 
have spoken to Sir Henry this morning, and we shall make a plan of campaign founded upon my observation. I will not speak of it now, but it should make my next report interesting reading. Second report, Dr. Watson. Baskerville Hall, October. My dear Holmes, if I was compelled to leave you without much news during the first days of my mission, I am clearly making up for lost time, as events are crowding thick and fast upon us. Sir Henry means to spare no expense in restoring the grandeur of his family. There have been decorators and furnitures up from Plymouth, a contractor from London. With the house refurbished, all he will need is a wife to make it complete. And between ourselves, there are signs this will not be wanting if the lady is willing. However, the course of true love does not run quite so smoothly. Today, for example, its surface was broken by a most unexpected ripple. Sir Henry insisted on going out. I insisted on your instruction I should not leave him. But Holmes, in all your wisdom, you did not foresee some things which have happened since I have been here. I am the last man in the world who wished to be a spoiled sport. I was at a loss what to say or do, for I had made up my mind. He had gone. But my conscience soon reproached me. I sought to overtake him, and made at once for Stapleton House. I mounted a hill from which I could command a view, and there I saw Sir Henry and Miss Stapleton deeply absorbed in conversation. To spy upon a friend is a hateful task, but I could see no better course. Sir Henry suddenly drew Miss Stapleton to him, but she protested. Next moment I saw Stapleton running wildly towards them. Stapleton verbally abused Sir Henry, who offered explanations, but then began angry himself when the other refused to accept them. Finally, Stapleton turned on his heel and led his sister away. His angry gestures showed the lady, too, was included in his displeasure. Sir Henry walked slowly back the way he had come, the very picture of dejection. I spotted his spine. He vouchsafed from the first he felt Miss Stapleton was made for him and he for her too. There's a light in a woman's eyes that speaks louder than words. Yet she talked of what danger this place was and that he should leave it. He told her the only way he'd go was if she'd come with him. And he told her disturbed brother of his feelings that she might honour him by becoming his wife. But, well, as I said, just to tell him what it means, it seems, he would owe me more than he could hope to pay. I wish I knew, truly. I tried several explanations, but I was completely puzzled myself. However, our congestions were set at rest by a visit from Stapleton that very afternoon. He came to apologise for his conduct, and after a long, private interview with Sir Henry, the breach was quite healed. Now I pass on to another thread, the mystery of the sobs in the night the tear-stained Mrs. Barrymore, and the secret journey of the butler to the western window. It was a melancholy vision. The hours crawled by. We had almost given up when we heard a creak out in the passage. We had arranged no plan of campaign, but Sir Henry is a man to whom direct action is the most natural course. He was using the candle as a signal. Another moved also, outside the window. Barrymore's had lived with Baskervilles for over a hundred years under that roof, and now we found him deep in some dark plot against us. But it was Mrs. Barrymore's doing. He had done nothing except for her sake. Her brother was starving on the moor. The light was a signal to him that food was ready. Seldom. The escaped convict. To her was always the curly-haired boy she had cared for and played with as an elder sister would. The Barrymores were free to go, but Sir Henry was determined to go and get the man on the moor. Five minutes later we started our expedition. The night air was heavy with the smell of damp and decay, and something else. It was the cry of a hound. Could there be some truth to the stories? Was it possible we were really in danger from so dark a cause? But he did not wish to turn back. He came to get his man and 
get in he would. The hound holds. There was the hound. I would not forgive myself for having led him to his fate. But how could I know Sir Henry would risk his life alone upon the moor in the face of all our warnings? I moved to send for help to bear the body. But Holmes, the body had a beard. It was Selden. But the suit was Sir Henry's. It was clear the hound had been given the scent from some article of Sir Henry's. In all probability, the boot from the hotel. And had run that wretch to ground. Such are the adventures of last night. The moor and its inhabitants remain as inscrutable as ever. I wish you could come down to us. Extract from the diary of Dr. Watson, October 26th. I am conscious of a feeling of impending danger which is more terrible because I am unable to define it. My first impulse was to tell Sir Henry, but his nerves have been strangely shaken by the death upon the moor. Also, earlier today, Barrymore made a startling revelation. Admitting he should have said so before, though it was long after the inquest that he had found it out, he knew why Sir Charles had been at the gate in that fateful hour. It was to meet a woman. It had a letter that morning from Coombe Tracy, and addressed in a woman's hand. No more was thought of it until a few weeks ago when Mrs. Barrymore found the ashes at the back of the grate in his study. It crumbled away in his hands as he read it. Please, please, as you are a gentleman, burn this letter and be at the gate by ten o'clock. L. L. We now know there is someone who has the facts, if only we can find her. October 27th. I walked out upon the moor, full of dark imaginings. On returning, Dr. Mortimer gave me a lift homewards. He gave me ample chance to make use of his local knowledge. Could he tell me the name of any woman whose initials were L.L.? Why, yes. Laura Lyons. Reverend Franklin's daughter does indeed live in Coombe Tracy. She married an artist named Lyons, though the blackguard deserted her, and her father cut her off for marrying without his consent. Sir Charles was her discreet benefactor, enabling her to earn an honest living. Such was the situation into which I arrived on the moor, bearing a telegram from Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard, detailing a warrant for the arrest of the culprit and proof that the woman masquerading as Stapleton's sister was, in fact, his wife, thus making his manipulation of Reverend Franklin's daughter, Laura, under the false name of Lyons, purely for the purpose of luring old Charles Baskerville to his death and for Stapleton's motives. One only had to hold up an old pair of his glasses to the portrait in the stairwell at Baskerville Hall to notice his uncanny yet undeniable family resemblance to the old devil Baskerville himself. Lestrade, upon his arrival, led myself, Watson, and Sir Henry, riding to the rescue of two damsels in distress. The lady we now knew as Mrs. Stapleton, and the unfortunate, the gullible Laura Lyons. He raised his revolver, aimed it at the glow of the phosphorus dust that had been coated on the hound's fur, to give it its ghostly appearance, making it thus an obvious target in the dark moonlight, and fired. The sound of the shot scared Stapleton into running, running to his 
death upon the deep, soft, fatal Grimpen mire, in which he sank up to his throat, before the sound of his cries for help echoed across the moor, with no one to hear but the two women he had so long and desperately abused. The body of the hound he had treated no more kindly, and whatever other ancestral ghosts may lay at the bottom of the sinking mud of Grimpen Mire. Such was the cause of the gloomy state of mind in which I sought recreation in a box at the opera. And perhaps, if my dear friend and compatriot, Dr. Watson, had finished making his notes with Lestrade and was free to join me, we could stop for dinner along the way. A little joint run by an Italian gentleman of good repute, but bad reputation, by the name of Marcin. 